Good morning. Great to have all of you here. We are starting a brand new series of messages called Giants, Five Smooth Stones to Victory. And today we're going to be talking about the giant of insignificance. And I, first of all, just want to say a big thank you. Everyone who is joining us this service, I'm so glad that you are here for our 11 o'clock service because we had no room for you at 930 and uh, this works out really well to be able to have three services and spread people out. I told people last service, you better start going to the 815 and give us a little bit of space in the room here. But it's been really cool. Um, God is regrowing. The church is coming back. And that whole, you know, um, pre-COVID, post-COVID thing, God is regrowing. The church is coming back strong. And uh, we're excited about what God has been doing, the way he's been working. Let me tell you, Friday night, man, was just, it was a God kind of thing. We felt God in the room. We knew that God had called us here as men as kind of a calling on the night for us to be here responding to the word and to see guys across the room worshiping. But really at the end, I challenge you guys to a high level of commitment as men of God. And uh, the men stepped up. I want to tell you that the men of this church stepped up in a big way. They filled the altars up here with commitments and fresh challenges in their own hearts. If you were a man and you were not here for our Friday night man time, the message that I shared was something I absolutely believe that every man in this church, you need to understand what you're joining. When you, when you sign up and say, I'm part of Eagle Creek Church, that means something and I want to tell you what that means. And so go on and listen to the message. I asked him to have it on the website. I haven't checked to see if it's on there yet. Um, but you should be able to go to eaglecreekchurch.com. And it helps us all to step our game up to the level of our calling. This is what God has asked us to do. What is that? How do we live up to it? So I'm not going to re-preach it. Um, but I'm going to challenge you to go and listen to that. I had several guys talk to me and say, hey, listen, I want my kid to hear this. I want my uh, brother in law to hear this. I want a friend of mine to hear this. So we want to encourage you to do that. Today, as we're getting into this series, by the way, if I haven't introduced myself, I'm Matt. I am the pastor here. And if you're like, who's that guy up there doing all the talking? He's the pastor, okay? Um, my wife and I started the church about 17 years ago, and it's been really cool to see how God has grown his people and grown his church and what he's doing here. And so many of you have now come together and we're partners together in the kingdom to build a work for Christ. One of the great giants that we have to overcome in our lives is a giant of insignificance. I believe that everyone really wants to feel like they're important in life, but sometimes life just happens to you. And how many of you know that sometimes life just happens? Like some of you, if your kid were to come up to you at age 15 and say, did you plan on being A, and then they fill in the blank of what your occupation is, a carpenter, a salesman, a, a cafeteria lady. Did you, was this your life's plan? How many of you would say, I didn't actually think of this whenever I was a kid. It just, life, life happens, you know? And you change careers and opportunities open and you move around and you have kids and you need good benefits and all this stuff happens. But somewhere along the way, people will often start to question and say, is this it? Am I supposed to be doing something more than I'm doing? Was life meant to be more significant than this? I felt like I had a better job when I was young and like I was really doing something and I don't know if this really has much meaning for me. I had someone who talked to me that had recently retired and said, man, I was dealing with this issue of significance so much after retirement. Is, is this it? Where, what's my meaning and my value in life right now? And so I think even from the time we're little kids, uh, how many of you have had little kids? Okay, little kids will try to get your attention. How many of you have heard the, look mom, look mom, look in here, look dad, look dad, look what I can do, look what I can, and after a while you're like, oh, please stop saying that phrase, look, I'm, I'm trying to look, but I'm trying to cook right now too, and I just don't have, I can, my eyes can only go one direction, so, and if you have multiple kids and they're all saying look, then it's really in trouble, and you do your very best, now, look mom, I, my niece was over one uh, time, and she gave herself this amazing haircut, she had bangs, Look, look, look at my haircut. <laughs> Actually, she kind of had the sheepish look like, Ooh. you know, is that okay? No, that's not okay. We don't cut our own hair. Look at the makeup I did on my little sister with permanent marker. Yeah. 
I remember in high school, um, I was doing one of those, try to get the girl to look at me. Have you, you ever watched boys when they try to get the girl to look? You notice how their posture changes and their chest goes out and their shoulders go back and they walk around like, you know, like they're a cowboy or something. I don't know what they think they are. I've re- I learned, and now a couple teenage boys in my own family, I've learned a quick cure for that. Pop. You know, suddenly they're like this, and, and we're not doing that anymore, and it's just fun, you know? I was trying to impress the girl. There's four, uh, four of us boys are real close to the same age, four boys in five years in our family. There's a fifth boy, he's, you know, like five and a half years older than us, my sister. But the four boys, it was Mike and Liz and the four boys. I didn't get a name until, you know, I was about 15. Finally, I was like, hey, I'm Matt. Someone knows me by name. Four boys. And so we, and we turned everything into a competition. We're at youth kind of overnighter at the church, and they rented a gym, and it's got one of those big ropes, and we're swinging and jumping and just playing around. And finally, someone sets a marker, and it's like, I jumped that far. And we're like, oh, I can beat that. If you've ever had a bunch of boys, you know, I can beat that. It's just the way it works. Suddenly, everyone can beat that, and we're all going, and we're all going all out. Now we're starting to be stupid and reckless, and we're not thinking, but... I'm the only brother with a girl on the sideline, so I'm like, guys, cut me some slack. I gotta look good in front of this girl. And now they said a mark I can't hardly hit, and so now I've gotta be really stupid to beat that mark. And so I fly out horizontal, not knowing how in the world I'm actually gonna stick the landing. Turns out that wasn't a good idea. My chin found the ground before my feet did. And I got up and I was like, there's lots of loose, hard things in my mouth right now. Hmm. Maybe I should go rinse my mouth out and see what that is. Lots of teeth fragments. I rinsed it out, thought, oh, it's just a little bloody and a lot of teeth fragments. I'm okay. I turned around and the girl is standing looking at me like gross and I smiled like, I'm great. (laughs) And my front tooth literally slid out of my mouth when I smiled. And my brother Steve goes, and he runs and grabs me, and he's like, Matt, your front tooth. I'm like, oh, (laughs) how about that? Turns out it was a cracked jaw, a bunch of fractured teeth, and I lost my front tooth. Anyway, the things we will do to be important, the things we will do. I got totally sidetracked on that story, didn't I? I think everyone fights for significance until they give up the fight. And I think what's more sad than fighting and not feeling significant is when people no longer care that their life has any meaning any longer. And when they can sit at home depressed all the time saying it's pointless, my life is pointless, I don't get what, that anything even matters. And then they replace significance, I mean real significance, with something that's a cheap alternative that the American culture provides in volumes pleasure well if I can't have significance I can have a boat nothing wrong with a boat good for you have a boat but your significance is not that you had a boat when you get to heaven hey St. Peter what'd you do well I went and opened up churches and preached the gospel and led thousands of Christ I had a boat a boat oh what kind of boat did you have because you're really significant in heaven if you had a bigger boat Did you have a cabin too? Oh oh my goodness, we got a special street in heaven for people with cabins and boats. We replace significance with pleasure as you as Christians. Do you understand that? And that is no replacement. They don't equal out in life and they don't equal out in heaven. And I wanna warn you, when you start to feel like you're insignificant, you'll go into depression, or you'll go into pleasure seeking. And instead, God has a better plan for your life, and that's what we're gonna focus on today, on what that plan is and how to reach that and how to not be cut shy of what God actually has for your life. So here's where we're gonna start. We're gonna start with this. I'm gonna give you four thoughts. I want to say four thoughts. And if you write them down, you'll remember them better, by the way. Here you go. Thought number one is this. Trust that sovereignty creates significance. That doesn't make sense to you yet, but I'll explain it and then it will. So everyone say it with me. It'll help you remember it as well. Let's say this together. Trust that sovereignty creates significance. Okay. 
I want to read in 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. It's about the anointing of King David to be king, but for him to be king, someone else has to be ousted. So let's read. The Lord said to Samuel, this is a prophet of God, who is the person that God has appointed to anoint the next king, the first king, the second king of Israel. It's his job to do this. So the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? That's the king that's presently king. And God said, I'm done with him. He disobeyed me. He defied my orders. He basically desecrated a sacrifice in a way that was un he, he thought he could be a priest when he's not. He's a king. I've got, I'm done with Saul. Why are you going to grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself, myself a king among his sons. Now, Saul's kind of depressed. He's like, man, I, I felt like God had this huge plan. And God was going to use Saul, and you know, it's like God's going to work through this guy, and we're going to become this great kingdom here in the Middle East, and, and uh, God's going to just be with us, and it's going to be a powerful and awesome thing. In fact, I was part of the whole plan. I was part of this whole thing. I went and anointed him, and I felt like that's what God said to do, and now the whole thing's falling apart. I mean, don't be depressed about the things that have fallen apart in your life in your past and the things you dreamed of that didn't happen no you need to get up and keep moving now you need to move forward Samuel into a future that I still have for Israel I haven't quit I haven't given up on I'm not done with Israel in this now when we talk about God's sovereignty God's sovereignty is his right and power to do I think we have that definition on the screen we don't it's his right here you go nope that's not it either I'll go ahead and read it God's sovereignty is his right and power to do all that he decides to do. So I want to kind of clue you in here for just a moment. I think that God has decided things very specific to your life. In his sovereignty, he has a decision about the ministry and the difference and the impact you will make on other lives. I think for God, for Israel, he's like, I know that I, I'm going, a king will be appointed. I know that I'm going to raise this up and make this a great nation because I'm going to bless all the world through Israel. I know that I am going to do this. But Saul's not the guy because Saul's not going to listen to me. Saul's not going to obey me. Saul's not going to do what I want him to do. He's just not going to be the guy. I wonder for you, if in your family lineage, if you went back six, seven, eight generations to your great, 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 great grandmother, if God didn't win her to faith in Christ and didn't put on her heart that your whole messed up family lineage from wherever you came and whatever country background and whatever spiritual history they had was going to change with her and she was going to share faith with her children and raise them in God-fearing ways and pray for her husband and be a submissive and honoring and respectful wife so that she won him over by her good deeds and by her good heart and he was so persuaded that he gave his heart to Christ but in the middle of it she got distracted and got busy and there was so much work to do that she just kind of dropped the ball on all of it and then maybe your great great grand grandfather God once again stepped in your family history and said I'm going to work through this guy and, and you're going to step up and you're going to be able to honor and respect your wife's role and you're going to be able to show love and show honor and you're going to raise your children in church and serving God but he got busy working out in the fields or working in the mines or working as a carpenter and he was so distracted and busy he dropped the ball and God's sovereign plan for your family has not ceased he still wants the lineage of your family to be followers of Jesus Christ, for it is God, not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance is what the Word of God tells us, what the Apostle Peter tells us. And so God has a sovereign plan for your family, and now he's poking at your heart and saying, what if you started family devotions? What if you started reading the Word to your children each night 
What if you started living out your faith in front of your family so that they could say mom loved God with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength, and she was an authentic follower of Christ, and she wasn't freaking out and screaming and cursing and yelling. She used to do that, but Jesus changed her heart, and she became the most godly and loving lady, and I respected her, and I decided when I got married, I would marry a man of God, and, and I would live and raise my family, and now generation after generation after generation generation has changed because one woman said yes to the sovereign work of God that he had always planned for your family lineage. How many of you would say yes to God doing something like that through you? Amen. Amen. I believe God has a sovereign plan for your workplace. I believe that God has a sovereign plan for the school that you attend and he is looking for someone to do that through. Saul won the right guy, he blew it. It didn't mean God's plan had changed in God's sovereignty. He wants to do something through every person so you feel insignificant. And yet God has a sovereign plan for you to do. How can we feel insignificant if God has a sovereign plan? Because we haven't discovered it. We're not living in it. We're just trying to pass our time to come up with something that sounds big enough for people to be impressed with. Oh, I don't want to say I'm doing that. Whenever God called me into ministry, let me tell you what I was planning to do. I was going to go to college and study political science, and I was hoping that I might be a foreign dipl diplomat and that I would maybe after a while be able to get some appointments and move up the political ladder and be someone of noteworthiness to my family lineage because I'd had a broken family. And I felt like my mom needed someone in the family to step up and stand out to make her feel like her life was worthwhile and it was my job to do that somehow. And so I was gonna do something, she was really into that, and so I would do something noteworthy. And when God called me to ministry, I was so depressed by that. I was like, God, that's not, that's not big, that's not cool, I'm not gonna earn a lot of money, I'm not gonna have big prestige, I need people to know that I was worth something so that my mom knows that she was worth something. I mean, you say, that's kind of a screwed up little kid head. You need to go get counseling. I did. But that's where I was. And all these things that God wants to do through our lives, it's funny that we try to figure out, well, that doesn't fit into what I view as impressive or what I want everyone else to think was impressive of my life. No, but if it's what God has created you for, you will find so much significance in it. I wanna tell you this. I have never, ever, ever looked back and thought, oh, maybe I should have gone the other direction. I've never for a moment thought that. I found my purpose in obedience. And God has been able to work through that. In Job chapter 42 and verse two, it says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. God, you're sovereign, and I know that whatever you wanna do, you can do through my life, and nothing can stop you from doing that once I say yes to your work in my life. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse nine, it says this, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts hearts are what? How committed? Fully committed to him. He's just looking and saying, if I could just find a man who was fully committed to me, I would totally use that guy. I would work through that guy. I would strengthen him. He's looking for businessmen that if he blessed you with a million dollars, you would build the kingdom of God. And I don't say that to say, oh, given that offering more. I say that to say God has missionaries, God has works that are started in the city that are serving the poor, God is using other guys to start new churches. I don't care where it goes. The point is, that, I'll tell you this, there are some men and some women in our church that are blessed financially in big ways. They've launched out, they started huge businesses, God has grown it, good things have happened, and so they give in a big, big way. Here's what I know about them and what I believe. God in his sovereignty said, I'm just looking for a business owner that wouldn't just promise they would give it away, but would actually do it. And when he finds one that does, he says, then I'm gonna bless you. He's looking for someone who will be fully committed so that he can strengthen that one. What is God wanting to do through your life? And please do not quit your day job and go start a business because I preach this message. That is not the point of the message. 
I always end up with people coming up this next week saying, oh, so I feel like I'm supposed to start my job and go do this. I'm like, no, 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 no. It may be that God's telling you to start a business so you can fail and learn to trust him more. So just before you sign up, realize sometimes God tells us to launch out and do things so we will fall flat and we will learn he is God and we are not and slow down and listen better next time. I don't know. So I'm just warning you up front. I've seen, a, I've seen a lot more of that than the other. But here's what I know. God is raising people up so that your marriage will be the example marriage to all of your friends. Not so you can brag on your marriage, but so that God can humble and break the two of you into a relationship that is so whole and healed that you can bring wholeness and healing to other people. And that is his destiny. And he said, here's the great part of your life is I'm gonna bring wholeness and healing to your marriage and I will work purposefully to heal other lives. I don't know where it is, but I know all over the place God has things he wants to do through us. Here's the second thought. We have to break the barriers of two, in, two significance. There's always gonna be a barrier. Anytime God says, I wanna do something more through your life, Satan's gonna come against you and try to break that. So let me read this passage here real quick. First Samuel 16, two to five. And Samuel said, and God says, hey, go anoint someone else. And Samuel said, how can I go if the king, if Saul hears it, he's going to kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and to invite Jesse to the, sa invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem the elders of the city came out to meet him trembling and they said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice and consecrate Jesse and his sons and invite them to the sacrifice. You see, there was a reason Samuel might be reluctant to go because he knew that the king in a very barbaric time in human history had complete authority to tell any of the soldiers, hey, see that prophet over there that says he's gonna go anoint someone else to be king? Bring me his head. And it would happen just like that. Head would be off Samuel, be brought to him, and he'd say, you aren't anointing anyone else to be king. And so Samuel's a little bit nervous about going and doing this. I believe that whenever God appoints you and says, I wanna do something significant through your life, there's always gonna be something that comes against you in that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 17 to 18, the apostle Paul, man of faith, he, there were such levels of miracles happening in the apostle Paul's life that literally at one point in his ministry when he would be out working doing tent making work, he actually built tents to provide for himself often in cities where he went as missionary, he would be wiping his brow with cloths and people would be snatching the cloths up that he was dropping behind him and they would be running them to their relatives and putting it on their relatives and their relatives would get healed. How many say, never had that one happen? Me neither. So this guy's pretty like got it together with God. And this is what it tells us in 1 Thessalonians. Paul's saying this, but since we were torn away from you brothers for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again. But who? Satan hindered us. God had a plan in his sovereignty. We know God wanted me to be there and to be preaching and building up your faith and doing the kind of work that I do as an apostle, as a preacher, as a teacher, as a man of God. God wanted me to be there doing it, but man, Satan was always in the way of things trying to get there and trying to do the work that God had called me to do. I want to tell you this. God's going to put some things in your heart, just a simple thing like, hey, why don't you go home and you have a broken relationship with your spouse right now, with your husband, with your wife, and there's been a lot of pride and neither one of you will break and just say to the other one, I'm sorry, or, or even just do a simple thing like saying, I love you. I mean, you can't break the ice. There's a hardness right there. And so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to have you go home. You're going to break the ice. You're going to say, I love you. Well, Satan's hindered me. Why, how'd that happen? 
Well, I determined to do that, but when I woke up in the morning, she was on a tirade about something, and I couldn't do that. I had to defend myself about that, and how did that happen? Anyone want to guess who was in the middle of making that thing go down? And Satan hindered us. You see, every time, uh, hey, I'm going to do family devotions, and my teenager said, what? I can't do that. I was going out with my friends Sunday night at 6. I can't say, what do we have to do that? That's dumb. I'm sorry, I have a parent of teenagers, if it sounds familiar. No, they don't talk like that to us. <laughs> ever, ever. I know, it sounds like I'm joking. They really don't. It doesn't fly. But I want to tell you, we do family devotions and everyone runs up to the table and opens the, the word of God. <laughs> That's the way that works. But you work towards that because we have been hindered but we've decided we will not be hindered. We will forcefully fight through to the work of God even when Satan gets in the way. Amen? Amen. 1 John 3, 8. The Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. And over and over and over, every town he visited, every person possessed by Satan beat down and depressed by Satan, addicted and bound by Satan, could never stand up to the presence of Jesus. Every time he said, go, Satan went. Every time he said, be free, people were free. And so because of that, then every town that he went to, anyone who felt like Satan was like having a hold on their life, or the relatives did, they brought all who were possessed, oppressed, depressed, whatever it was, they brought them all, and they were all free because Jesus has power over anything Satan will try to hinder you from doing. That's just the reality. That's just the truth of it. It doesn't mean he won't try, but I won't be backed into a corner and shut down on the work of God in my home and in my marriage and as a pastor and in my community and God's work in my own heart. If God has said sovereignly, I want you to be free and live holy. If God has said sovereignly, I want you to know the word at a deeper level so you can preach at a better level. Sovereignly, I want you to minister to, I, I'm at an age now where I'm the old guy on the block, so I'm gonna meet with younger pastors and bring encouragement life and wisdom at different times and so I love it being in that role Satan may try to hinder that man I'm, I'm not going to be hindered I'm going to keep doing whatever God has created and called this guy to because my significance is not in what people think of me but in what God has created and called me to do it's in his sovereign work God says this is what you're meant to do I say yes even though Satan says no one more time can I hear you say yes yes, yes to whatever God has called you to do we won't be shut down. Then I want to give you this third area. Just briefly, I think you'll get this one pretty quick. Third area is reject the world's view of significance. I'm going to go ahead and read through this passage, just kind of straight through here. 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 11. When they came, the, okay, so now he's with Jesse and his sons. When he came, he looked on Eli. That's the oldest son of Jesse. He's got eight sons. Seven are there. He looked on Eliab and he thought, well, surely the Lord's anointed us before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on, where am I? Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. Let me tell you, that spoke to me when I read it. This is just a word from God. And you know how the word of God just speaks to you some days. Well, that was a good one. Some of you guys are like, yes, yeah, speaking to me too right now. <laughs> Because I have rejected him. Come on, Lord. Y'all have to get in line behind me on this one. And then he says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. The Lord looks on, or man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord is looking on the heart. Then Jesse called the next one Abinadad, and he made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by the third one, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made the seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are, are, are all your sons here? 
And he said, well, there, there remains yet the youngest, but, you know, he's out keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we're not going to sit down until he comes. You see, any time God is like, in his sovereignty, said, I want to I wanna use you. Well, you can't use, use me at work. No, no, I'm, I'm probably not the one to be a witness there, God. No, there's this guy at work. He's like a really good Christian. I mean, people really respect that guy. Well, yeah, but that guy ain't speaking up, is he? Well, he talked to me. Yeah, because you're another Christian. He's cool with talking to Christians, but he ain't going to be a light to anyone but other Christians. He's never going to do that. I need you to do it. Well, no, I, I'm like... I like messed up this last week and I really lost it when an order came in wrong and I, I like blew up and I, I felt really embarrassed for the next few days. I was hanging my head down. I can't, I can't do that. There's always someone better. How many of you know there's always someone better? Hey, hand, hand passing faith down to my family lineage to the next generation. I'll try to get my kid. Maybe he'll become a better Christian than I am and then he can really do the job you should do with raising the next generation. I'll tell them what they ought to do with their kids even though I didn't do it with mine. We can always pass the buck, can't we? We can always say there would be someone so much better at this. You know, um, today, one of our staff members three years ago um, started a church up in uh, Kansas City, Vive Culture, Brian Rose did, and we love those guys, and they've done a great job building the church there. I've had a, I've had a number of guys, today they're celebrating their three-year anniversary, and I've had a number of guys go and start churches, four or five different guys, and I talked to my wife, I'm like, none of them really came and started working for me with the idea they would go start a church. I'm like, why do all these guys go and start churches after working for me? And, and my answer is, if Matt can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> I'm like, they just look at me and like, man, if that guy can do it, probably anyone could go start a church and they, they all go give it a whirl. And, and here's the thing. I don't think God looks at that. I don't think God is looking at all that outward stuff. He's just saying, hey, what about you? Will you do it? Well, yeah, I'll do it. And here's how it happens for all us nobodies who become somebodies in God's kingdom. I believe that God just chooses us and says, I'm just going to do something because I can. I want to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. Verse 27. It's the second half of the verse. I had two halves. I'm going to read the second half. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 27 says, but God chose the foolish things of the world. That's you and me. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world. That's you and me. The weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world. That's you and me. And the despised things, the things that are not the nobodies, to nullify the things that are the somebodies. God just said, you know what? I think my power would be shown better in the powerless. I think my might would show better in a weak vessel. I think I could be bigger in the small. I think that I would be seen instead of them if I used that person. How many of you would say, well, under those terms, I probably qualify. God could probably use me. If he can use people like that, God could probably use me. Now listen, I know I got a lot of smart, intelligent, educated, successful people. We got people from every gamut and every class of life. I think the key is to realize it's not me, it's God in me. Amen? It's that humble place of saying, I didn't arrive here on my own. I'm not the wisest and the best and the smartest guy. I am gifted by God, and I've said yes to my giftedness, and God's blessed it and used it. And when you get that down, you'll become maybe the wise and successful. But as long as your heart is the humble and the dependent, God can keep doing big things through you. Amen? God can keep doing those things. So how does it happen? I think the first way is the sovereignty of God. And the second, and to me, I know I'm on the fourth point, but this is the second way it happens. We rely on the Spirit's anointing for significance in our life. In 1 Samuel Samuel 16, verses 12 and 13, let's look at 12 and 13. And he sent and brought him in. Who did he bring in? David. I want to pause for just a moment. If you're David, everyone pause for a moment. You're David, you're out watching sheep. One of your brothers, servants, whoever, runs out and says, hey, your dad wants you back up at the house. Why does he want me back at the house? 
He's got the prophet. What? We got a prophet? Who? What prophet? We got Samuel. We have the prophet. You know, it's not a prophet. That's the prophet. That's the king appointer, anointer prophet. What's he doing here? Well, apparently he's like anointing the next king. What? One of my brothers is going to be king? Uh, well, you better come. What's going on? He already passed up all your brothers. Oh, oh, are you serious? Yeah. Why didn't dad, like, have me up there? Why didn't dad ask me to come? He's asking you now. I mean, but he had everyone else up there, and you walk in the room, there's all your brothers and dad. Seriously, guys? Like, everyone's here, but not me? Sorry, kid. I just figured it'd been your older brothers. Thanks, Dad. But you know what? You get over that being overlooked. Some of you have been overlooked in life. Some of you felt like someone else got everything and you got nothing. Get over that. Because the moment you can humble yourself and say, but God, what would you make for me? What did you create me for? So I didn't get that husband, that wife, that job, that house, that career. But what did you have for me, God? What did you want for me? Listen to what God wanted for him. And he sent, he brought him in. And now he was ruddy, means he's kind of reddish complexion, freckle faced boy, beautiful eyes. In other words, Samuel's still worried about the outward appearance here. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil he carried all that way, worried he's going to get his head cut off the whole journey. He took that horn of oil, one about the heifer, one about the sacrifice, one about the horn of oil, the representation of the anointed power of God, the Holy Spirit that comes on a life. And when a life and when a person finally says, yes, I will be the woman of God, God created me to be in this home and in this marriage. And a husband says, yes, I will pursue the career of God and the choices God has given me. And I will raise my sons and daughters to be men of God. And I will say yes to the sovereign plan of God in that moment in that moment and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David what did it do it rushed upon David from that day forward and he becomes the greatest king in all of Israel's history I want you to know you are not insignificant God has created your life for such significance it's just not what you've been imagining it to be. It's not a world standard of significance. It's a God's sovereignty significance where he said, I know what I want to do with you. If you'll just lean in and listen to me. But God, give me the big picture so I can decide first. Give me the big plan. And when I hear the big plan, I'll decide. And God's like, that isn't the way it works. I just want you to get up tomorrow morning and say, I'm sorry to your wife. I don't want to do that. I want a big plan. No, no. I just want you to go to work and over lunch break, see if someone wants to sit and study the Bible during lunch. I don't want, I want a big, like the whole workplace is going to come to Jesus and I'm going to stand up on my desk and preach. And no, no, ain't going to be that. All it's going to be is you asking this one person if they want to do a little Bible study over lunch. We want the big thing and God wants the small obedience. Amen? We want the big thing, and God wants the small obedience. You see, whenever God called me into ministry, you know what I did? I helped clean the church in Archie. Woo-hoo-hoo! Big time now in ministry of the calling of God. I am the church janitor. And then I got to be in a choir. Oh, they helped me sing. And then they let me hold the mic and be on the worship team. Oh, my goodness. And my youth pastor asked me one time to preach in a youth group. He didn't ask me after that one. Wow, big stuff. That wasn't any big stuff. It was small obedience. It was always small obedience. Small obedience. You see, in God's sovereign plan... There are very big, significant things you're supposed to be doing right now 
Some of you are doing them right now because you've been living in this sovereign place of God's will and you're walking it out as a mom and you are a generational changer for God with your children. Wow! The significance you will carry for generations of your family history. It's amazing the blessing you have become. You are carrying out the work of God and there are men that are raising sons and daughters powerfully to know God. You are changing generations right now and there are others, you just can't find your spot and your place and you're like, oh, God can't use someone like me and God is saying, I'm right here. Would you just say yes to this daily obedience so that I can begin to pour my spirit of anointing on you and it can empower you for all the significant things you were created for because there is a sovereign will for each of your lives. Can you give me a yes to that? You see, no one in this room is insignificant. You're not. You were never created by our almighty, powerful, sovereign God to be insignificant. You were made in the image of God and nothing made in God's image is insignificant it has great purpose and great value in life some of you here today want to I want to ask you something okay it's okay if, if you're here and you're not a Christian and you're not you've never really committed your life to follow Jesus Christ and you listen to this and it feels like, I know, oh, I want this. I just, I don't know how to grab this. I can't actually get a hold of what you're saying and pull it into my heart. It's so good, but it's so beyond my grasp. I want you to tell you, the very first step is not what I just preached today. This is a second step for you. Everything I said, it's second. First place we find significance is not in our calling to act and obey God and, and do these things. That's not the first place of significance. That's the second place. The first place of significance is in a relationship. I want to tell you something about me and my wife. I find deep significance in who we are together, not in what we do. What we've done is we've, we have four kids and a home, and we work together, and manage, all these things, yeah, that's great. But when all that's said and done, you know where the great significance is? It's in the us thing. It's in the her and I in the relationship, okay? Let me tell you something about me and God. It's not in the what God has done and all this through me. It's in the just he and me together where I feel his love and I know that I'm important to him and I feel valued. And I want you to tell you this. If you're not yet a Christian, the first step is saying, I am distant from God. And the reason is because I keep defying him in my own conscience. I keep rebelling in my heart and doing whatever I want to do. Even though I know it's wrong, I just do it anyway. I say what I want to say. I act how I want to act. I, I'm cut off, I'm broken, I don't feel the connection to God, I don't have that relationship. God knows that. And there's a real consequence. The reason you feel so bad about it is because you should feel bad because you will be punished after this life. There's no way around that. It will happen. Unless, unless you turn to Jesus who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father, to God except through me. How do we come to God through him? This is what he did. He gave his life on the cross, innocent and sinless. And when he did it, he paid the price for every sin you've ever committed against God. So that if you would just look up to that cross and say, you did that for me? Yeah, I did that for you. Then I'm going to trust that what you did is enough to forgive me. I'm sorry. Forgive me, God. And God will look down on you and say, okay, you're forgiven. Everything you've ever done, you trust that Jesus paid the price for you. I trust that Jesus paid the price for me. Then it's all gone. And what does that mean? It means I bring you in and you're my child. And I love you and you're significant and you're part of my family. You're adopted. You're a kid of Christ right now and a kid of the Father. So I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer in a moment. And in that prayer, you're going to do two things. You're going to say, I believe. Well, really three things. I confess that I've sinned, and I deserve to be judged for it. But I believe Jesus paid the price. That's the second. 
and I commit myself to serve him as my Lord. And in a moment when we pray, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand up. The reason I do that is the Bible says if we confess Jesus before the world, he'll confess us before his Father in heaven. I think it's important to do that. So we raise our hands as our public confession of faith. I confess before the world I'm following Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? This is your moment with God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right where you're seated. If you hear and say, I am absolutely ready to do this. I need Jesus to save me of my sins so that I can find my first step of significance in relationship with him. Would you raise your hands real high right now? All across the room, they're going up. My goodness, front to back and side to side, people have raised their hands to respond and say, I'm giving my heart to Christ. Okay, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer of faith, and I'm going to ask the whole church to support you in this prayer as we pray aloud together. Let's pray together right now. Jesus, I admit I've sinned against you more times than I can count. But I believe that you paid for those sins when you died for me on the cross. And I believe that you rose again three days later and that now I can have eternal life when I believe in you. And I do believe. I also surrender to you. I want you to take charge of my life and my decisions and my future. Thank you for loving me and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen and amen. Would you give a hand for everyone that just prayed with us?